Hello everybody, I hope you're all well. Just last month, Miley Cyrus won her first ever Grammy and she performed her now Grammy winning song, Flowers. And let me tell you guys, I've watched this performance along with Dua Lipa's Who Do You Know performance so many times. Her energy is so contagious, but a very large talking point of her performance was her body and her muscle definition. It quickly began trending on social media and this, I believe she's a Pilates instructor or she owns a Pilates studio, one of the two, jumped onto TikTok and said that Miley Cyrus's body looks like this because she does Pilates and her arms have such strong muscular definition because of Pilates. And after this, Pilates arms began trending on TikTok. And this TikTok amassed millions of views. I think currently it's sitting at over half a million likes. And this TikTok not only coined the term Pilates arms, but I'm sure encouraged many young women and girls across the globe to book their first ever Pilates class. And the reason why I'm talking about this today is because I'm not gonna sit here and tell you guys whether Pilates is gonna make you look like Miley Cyrus or not. There's already a few video essays on here discussing sort of the truth behind Pilates. My friend Madison made a really good one. So I'll leave both of those linked down below. But today, rather, I'm going to talk about how this current cultural obsession with Pilates alongside wellness and that girl and clean girl and Pilates princess is actually just concealed and rebranded diet culture. Wellness is just diet culture in a different font. And not only do I want to discuss that with you guys today, but I also want to talk about why on earth diet culture is so pervasive and incessant. Why does it keep on coming back in different forms, each unrecognizable from the other? And obviously we all know me here. I fell down a wormhole. <laughs> I fell down a wormhole. I also wanted to discuss the shortcomings of the wellness industry and the fact that it functions within a capitalist system and also how people who are really, really into wellness can actually be more susceptible to right-wing radicalization and believing in conspiracy theories we're getting into it. And just before we get into it, I would love to thank Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. Scentbird are a perfume subscription service where you can try out a wide range of different scents from loads of different brands at an affordable price. And it's really, really easy to get started. You just jump onto the Scentbird website and you fill out their quiz where they ask you all sorts of different questions of whether you prefer feminine or masculine scents. What sort of mood? Do you wanna be playful? Do you wanna be mysterious? What type of scents you're attracted to yourself? Whether you prefer more fresh scents, more warm scents, what energy you're seeking. They truly, they truly have it all. And once you fill out the quiz, Scentbird will curate you a collection of scents to try from, which they think will be best suited to you and your current needs and desires. From a wide range of different brands like Marc Jacobs, DKNY, Juicy Couture, Ariana Grande, Gucci. With the Scentbird subscription service, you will receive a 30 day supply of a different fragrance every single month. So not only do you get to try out loads of different fragrances, but you also get to test out a fragrance for 30 days before committing to the full bottle. And also with the 30 day supply of perfume from the Scentbird subscription, it comes in a very handy case where you can throw it in your bag, you can take it to the airport with you. And Scentbird have very kindly given me a discount code for you guys. Use the code JTheresa in all capitals for 55% off your first a month at Scentbird. So it's only about $8 for your first month. Make sure you click the link in the description to visit the Scentbird website or scan the QR code on the screen now. Thank you so much Scentbird for sponsoring today's video and let's get into it. As I mentioned in the introduction to this video, after Miley Cyrus's performance at the Grammys, Pilates arms began trending on TikTok because of this TikTok user who credited Miley's muscular definition to Pilates. And look, I don't think that this comes from nowhere. Miley has been reported to be doing Pilates for well over a decade. Apparently she has a Pilates studio in her home, but, and I'm sure we're all thinking the same thing here. Isn't it crazy that after Miley Cyrus won her first ever Grammy, the talking point which was at the forefront was how her body looked, rather than her actually winning a Grammy. 
And this isn't me trying to say that you shouldn't be able to compliment the way that people look, but rather as human beings, specifically human beings who spend a lot of their time on TikTok, is they can never just compliment someone and move on. Instead, they have to figure out how they look like that, why they look like that, and then implement it into their own lives. And not only that, but also tell other women how they can implement it into their lives as well. And I'm not gonna sit here and say whether Pilates can make you look snappy or not because I am not an expert in this. <laughs> I literally have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to Pilates. But one thing I will say is that I don't think it's a particularly good idea to post a video on a website which is inundated with young women and girls and credit a specific exercise to a person's exact body type. Firstly, I think this is obvious, but it causes far more harm than good. But secondly, outside factors like diet, environment, genetics, race, class, sex can contribute to the way that your body responds to exercise. I feel like I struggle to talk about subjects like this because to the non-analytical ear, it just sounds like I'm telling people to not exercise. <laughs> which I, is not true. It's not true, okay? I am a firm believer that exercising is just good. Getting up and about, getting the endorphins pumping is always going to be good for not only your physical health, but also your mental health. I run and I swim. Okay, I love the endorphins pumping through my body after a good swim. Getting your body moving, getting the endorphins pumping, it's just objectively good for you. Any form of exercise is good for you, even if you just go out for a walk once a day for half an hour. But there is no doubting that within the last couple of years, there seems to be an increased cultural awareness of Pilates, specifically reformer Pilates, which is the Pilates with the big... It's with the big machine. Pilates as an exercise has existed for well over 100 years. I think the reason why it's become so popular so recently is not only through increased awareness on social media, but also similarly to yoga, Pilates is an exercise which encourages engaging with the body and the mind. Pilates as an exercise puts a lot of emphasis on breathing work. And the popularity of Pilates and yoga has obviously coincided I did with the rise of the wellness industry, which we will talk about in just a moment. Now, the next thing I'm going to say is not, <laughs> it's not rooted in any facts. It's not rooted in any facts. This is purely anecdotal from my POV, my POV, is that reformer Pilates is just the it girl exercise of the moment. I feel like on Instagram and on TikTok, I see it absolutely everywhere. I've seen brands have started doing Pilates classes as as part of their events. I've seen influencers post on their stories with their cute little Pilates outfit on and their like fancy Pilates studio. Also, it seems to me that Pilates is actually quite an aspirational exercise. Pilates, I think it costs about like 20 pounds per class. And if you wanted to get a gym subscription to a place that has Pilates classes, I think it will probably set you back between like 100 to 200 pounds, which to a lot of people is worth the investment. But obviously it's pretty different to a 30 pound gym subscription. And if we just circle back to the dressing cute for Pilates, I do actually think Pilates is in tune with current fashion trends. Pilates reminds me a lot of ballet core and current trends of athleisure wear. Frankie's Bikinis actually released an inspired Pilates collection. And look, I love it all. I love it all. And I think the next thing, which is always depressing to talk about, like I literally just wanna be like, all right, thanks for watching, bye guys, because I literally hate talking about this so much because it is so darn depressing. But we all know this by now that body types, especially women's body types, are trends. Boo, boo. And exercises peak and dip in turn with what body type is on trend at that time. So if you think about back to about 10 years ago, where having a small waist and a big butt was like the, but it was the body type that everyone wanted. The most popular exercises of that time were squats, weight training, which engaged the glutes and also using waist trainers. I just cannot get over the fact that I used to do the 30 day squat challenge 
religiously when I was a teenager. Bear in mind, I was literally a child, so nothing was going to help my butt. Like, nothing was going to engage those bones that were rattling back there. But these exercises were incredibly popular because they were associated with the most sought after body type of that time. And now that that trend has changed, you know, the way that people talk about Pilates on social media, people are beginning to associate Pilates with this very slim and toned body type. And I also think Pilates has had such a large boom in the last five years because of its association with wellness and its emphasis on connecting the mind and the body. Now, all exercises technically fall under the umbrella of wellness. Sorry, guys. This shirt is so slay, but these sleeves, I'm gonna have to start Ariana grounding it. Yeah. Now, all exercise obviously fall under the umbrella of wellness, but when we're talking about very modern day Western wellness, there is often a lot of emphasis on mental well being and mental clarity. Hence, why Pilates is seen as more of an exercise which is associated with wellness, despite the fact that. Both Pilates and weight training have, I'm assuming, similar, if not the same benefits for the mind and body. I made a video a couple of years ago discussing the wellness industry, so I'm not gonna get all into when the wellness industry was founded, how it started, etc. But the wellness industry is now worth over one trillion dollars. I do partly think this is because so many things fall under the wellness umbrella, but also I'm of the belief that nothing or very few things are an accident. I think that things are rarely a mistake or a coincidence. And I think there is absolutely a reason why the wellness industry has had such a large boom in the last five years. Firstly, as time goes on and the general public's opinions begin to sway more liberally and they begin to become more empathetic, 90s and 2000s diet culture has simply fallen out of favor with today's generation. You know, the 90s and 2000s diet culture of nothing tastes as good as skinny feels, smoking cigarettes as an appetite suppressor, and finding out that Victoria's Secret models wouldn't eat solid food for days running up to a show. This rhetoric has really fallen out of favor with today's generations because we have seen the detrimental impact that this can have on not only someone's physical health, but someone's mental health as well. And not just your own, but the people around you, your children. I think nearly everyone I know was raised by a mom who was constantly on a diet. You know, the society is a pendulum and we swung in the 90s and 2000s really the other way and now we're swinging more towards wellness and health. But also along with the internet comes an unprecedented access to information. Not only can you yourself go out and access information about your health, about illnesses, I think we've all been there when we have an ache or a twinge in our body and then we Google it and we find out that we are going to die in two weeks time. But not only can you access this information yourself. But now because of algorithms, that information is now being served to you without you even needing to look for it. And I know you guys already know what I'm gonna say. I don't think that this is very good. <laughs> and of course the pandemic, which led even more people to become more conscious about their health. <laughs> The message that I really want to get across in today's video is that I don't think that Pilates or any form of exercise is inherently linked with diet culture, but rather the modern day, specifically social media perception of Pilates is just diet culture in a different font. And let me explain why. If you don't know what diet culture is, it's essentially the superiority of thinness. I've spoken a lot about fat phobia on my channel in these two videos specifically, if you do want to check them out. But at the moment, I think we're in a really difficult time when it comes to diet culture because we can't extend body positivity to other people, but we cannot extend it to ourselves because this thin is better messaging has been hammered into our brains literally since when we became conscious. So trying to unlearn it is really, really difficult. I think something which is really important to note when we discuss social media's perception of Pilates is the language being used when we talk about Pilates. When people on social media, on TikTok are discussing Pilates, they are 
very often referring to thin women. They are saying that Pilates is an exercise that doesn't make you too bulky. The only reason why we aren't calling this or perceiving this as diet culture is because we're being told, oh, this isn't about losing weight. This is about being healthy. Oh, this isn't about your physical appearance. This is about your lifestyle. And I don't think a brand better displays that modern day wellness is just repackaged diet culture than aloe yoga. And I just wanna make this clear that this is all my own opinion. This is all my own opinion. This is all alleged, my own opinion. This is all my opinion. Not a lot of this is based in fact. So yeah, take with this what you will. Aloe is an American athleisure brand which was founded back in 2007. They obviously produce athleisure along with having a chain of gyms, yoga and exercise apps, and already aloe are a pretty controversial brand. They landed themselves in some hot water back in 2017 after yoga instructor and body positive advocate, and she was a former Cody instructor, Dana Falsetti, was served legal papers by Cody, which had just been acquired by Aloe because after the acquisition, Dana Falsetti posted on her Instagram story that Aloe perpetuates body shame and that an Aloe executive faced sexual harassment slash assault allegations. I became aware of Aloe only recently because I was looking for some new workout gear, new workout gear, couch to 5k, etc. The £130 price tag for leggings did put me off, especially when Aloe's good on you rating is very poor. And these over £100 leggings are made of mostly polyester. Woo! But there was one thing that I noticed whilst looking through the Aloe website and looking on their Instagram is that nearly everyone that I was seeing was beautiful and skinny. It seems clear to me that perhaps Aloe are trying to sort of intentionally curate this look for their brand and they're trying to appeal to a specific market. And weirdly on the Aloe website, when I was scrolling through and I only scrolled through a few pages, so obviously take this with a pinch of salt. When I was scrolling through a few pages, most of the women that I was seeing were a size small or a size extra small. And I was like, hmm, weird. Do they not do any size large or extra large? The only way that you can see pictures, as far as I'm aware, as far as I'm aware, the only way that I could view what the leggings would look like on a large or an extra large was if I clicked on the product and then I would have to click on a little tab and click on show on large. From what I saw on those few pages, not a single person who was a size large or extra large was the first image of the product. And I find it really interesting how Aloe has seemingly slipped through the cracks. When we have conversations around diet culture and body positivity, the most common culprits that we discuss are Victoria's Secret and Brandy Melville. And to me, the only difference between Aloe and Victoria's Secret is that one is perceived as healthy and the other is not. <laughs> the only difference between these two things is that one is covered in spandex or polyester rather and the other one isn't. And Aloe as a business are continuing to thrive. To quote Amy O'Dell's substack, Aloe Yoga became a behemoth by claiming to be something it's not. In early 2020, Harris told Forbes that revenue was around $200 million with the brand bringing in around $40 million between Black Friday and Cyber Monday in 2000. 2019 alone. In March of 2021, Fars Company reported that Aloe's revenue grew by 150% in 2020, which would put it at $500 million. The driver of that growth was the pandemic, a period of illness instead of wellness, when consumers doubled down on at-home fitness and loungewear, all things Aloe have been doing for a while. And I think the reason why brands like Aloe can slip under the radar when it comes to conversations about diet culture is that they are rarely using language which is associated with diet culture. In fact, they're doing the complete opposite. They're pedestaling health and wellness, which is why this kind of diet culture can be really difficult to spot. Diet culture has simply rebranded itself as wellness. And the reason for this, as I mentioned earlier, is that diet culture has massively fallen out of favor with younger generations. Not only do we see the physical and mental impact that diet culture can have on people, but also we are now all aware that diets very rarely work. In fact, 95% of diets don't work. As the decades have passed, we have become more aware of what yo-yo dieting is. Celebrities who used to tout fitness plans and DVDs and diet plans have now come out and spoken about how miserable 
miserable they were when they were on these diets. These same diets that they were selling to people. We have seen contestants of The Biggest Loser speak out about how their metabolisms are irreversibly damaged because of the extreme fitness and diet plans that they were subjected to. To quote Lucy Morgan for Glamour magazine, what's really behind the obsession with Miley Cyrus and her Pilates arms? In 2024, diet culture is harder to pin down. Celebrities are still thin, but they're also well. We don't just want their bodies, we want their apparent health. As a child, I remember reading a women's magazine feature about what famous women ate for breakfast. One woman answered something along the lines of lukewarm water, as it made her feel fuller for longer. Could she have given this answer in today's body positive climate? In this era, celebrities are mostly still thin, but we're encouraged to practice neutrality or even love when it comes to our own lumpier frames. It feels particularly disingenuous given the increased accessibility to weight loss drugs like Ozempic, which has surely contributed to the rise in celebrities dropping yet even more weight under the guise of a balanced diet, exercise, and above all, wellness. And this rebrand from dieting to wellness can be felt everywhere. Weight Watchers has recently rebranded to WW and now stress that they put more importance on health over weight loss. And of course, I cannot believe I have to say this, but some people are really dumb. Uh, <laughs> I am not saying that we should not exercise or eat healthily. I do these exact things. I think not only is it incredibly important to recognize diet culture in its current newest form, Form and recognize diet culture sneaking its way back into the mainstream, but also recognize that the wellness industry is worth over $1 trillion. And it functions on the basis that we need what they sell in order to be well. And I think this is where the real problems of the wellness industry come in because the wellness industry is functioning in a late stage capitalist system. The profits begin to take priority and this is with any industry, not just wellness, but wellness can take a steeper turn for the worse because we are handling people's health. We are handling their lives, their bodies. The stakes are so incredibly high. And this is why, you know, some people who are really, really into their wellness tend to be a little bit defensive because if you disagree with them, you're not just disagreeing with a fleeting opinion of theirs, you are disagreeing with how they live their life. Often in this segment of this video, when I'm discussing wellness, I'm referring to modern day wellness giants, right? Like Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop or the Wonderlust Conference, which I read articles about both. And the cognitive dissonance between spreading messages of wellness and spirituality compared with the sheer consumerism at these events, because without profit, these events would not be able to run. You should find happiness within yourself, but what will help with that happiness is this crystal necklace, which you can buy right here. We would be at our healthiest if we ate the way we used to when when we were cavemen, but also don't forget to buy your green powder and also to drink this flavored water, which is packed full of sweetness. And I think that Gen Z, myself included, tend to think of themselves as slightly separate from wellness, right? When I think of wellness, I often think of goop. But Gen Z are beginning to get entrenched in wellness via TikTok aesthetics. And I know that this sounds daft, but hear me out. I think that Gen Z and I'm talking about myself here, I'm on the older end of Gen Z. I think we are a pretty shallow generation and I don't even think it's of any fault of our own. I would say 80% of the things that we have perceived in our lives has been through a screen. It's been in 2D. So it's no wonder that we tend to value people's exteriors over their interiors. But I do believe that Gen Z are beginning to get entrenched in wellness culture via these, you know, sort of fleeting TikTok aesthetics, like that girl, clean girl, Pilates princess, because not only only are these TikTok aesthetics, but they are also lifestyles. They're very aesthetically pleasing, beautiful lifestyles to look at if people are making good content about it. And this similar cognitive dissonance takes place. To be that girl, you should drink water, but make sure it's out of a $50 Stanley cup. Or to be a Pilates princess, you should start taking Pilates classes. But it does help if you're wearing a cute Pilates outfit worth over $100. Look, we may think that the group ladies who carry jade eggs in their vagina are a little bit crazy, but Gen Z are very easily influenced and I don't think we're a far cry from that. <laughs> I do not think that girl is a far cry from carrying a jade egg in your vagina. One thing I will say is I 
don't think that Gen Z are as deeply entrenched in wellness culture as millennials and Gen X because I think being more and more into wellness comes with age, the closer you get to physically aging, the closer you get to death, the more likely you're going to turn to wellness and alternative medicines. I read this absolutely fascinating article, which was my favorite I've read for the research of this video on The Atlantic. It's titled Eating Towards Immortality by Michelle Allison. And it discusses the pervasiveness of diet culture and how a lot of diet culture is actually rooted in human beings' fear of death. This is how the omnivore's paradox breeds diet culture. Over Overwhelmed by choice, by the dim threat of mortality that lurks beneath any wrong choice, people crave rules from outside themselves and successful heroes to guide them to safety. People willingly, happily, hand over their freedom in exchange for the bondage of a diet that forbids their most cherished foods, that forces them to rely on the unfamiliar, unpalatable or inaccessible, all for the promise of relief from choice and the attendant responsibility. If you are free to choose, you can be blamed for anything that happens to you weight gain, illness, aging, in short, your share in the human condition, including the random whims of luck and your own inescapable mortality. And I think this is what really gets under my skin about the wellness industry is that the trillion dollar wellness industry is really preying on people's deep anxieties. It's absolutely no coincidence that the wellness industry is booming at a time of deep financial insecurity where it's really difficult to access healthcare. In the US, healthcare is not free. In the UK, healthcare is free, but it's been chronically underfunded for over 10 years. So to even seek medical advice and help is actually quite difficult. So it's no wonder that people are beginning to turn to alternative medicine. And I also think that that wellness is booming at a time when people are really craving community. I think that capitalism breeds individualism. I think we live in extremely individualistic times. I highly recommend checking out Mina Lay's video about Stanley Cups and the fact that we are in like a friendship epidemic. So many people are struggling to make friends and foster a community. And that is because capitalism breeds individualism. And I think that wellness is seen as this alternative to make friends and to build a community, which I think is so appealing to people who have been starved of community for the past 20 years or so. But this is where even more problems come in because modern day Western wellness is really difficult to separate from elitism and classism. Now, this is a very big blanket statement and this is just from the research that I've done for this video, but some of the most sought after wellness conventions come with a hefty price tag. I am talking thousands of dollars just for a ticket. And although some of these conventions like one Wanderlust do engage in conversations around whiteness and elitism and class. One of the most notable behemoths of the wellness industry, Goop, is probably unsurprisingly very apolitical. They hold a yearly festival slash summer in California and a weekend ticket will set you back $4,000. I would actually love to go for a video, but I cannot justify because it's not just the ticket. I'd have to get accommodation. I can't justify the cost right now, but I would absolutely love to go one day. And Lindy West attended the summit back in 2017 and she had a lot of interesting things to say about how apolitical the festival was. However, an event supposedly focused on being and achieving the optimal versions of ourselves, as Paltrow put it during her welcome address, cannot truly be depoliticized. You can't honestly address wellness, the things people need to be well, without addressing poverty and systemic racism, disability access and affordable healthcare, paid family leave and food insecurity, contraception and abortion, sex work and the war against drugs and mass incarceration. Unless, of course, you are only talking about the wellness of people whose lives are untouched by all those forces. That is, the wellness of people who are disproportionately well already. For her keynote to close the day, Paltrow purports to dissect the complexities and woes of being a working mother with a panel of famous gal pals, Cameron Diaz, Tori Burch, Nicole Ritchie and Miranda Kerr. How do they do it? How do they have it all? The women deliver a bounty of platitudes about ambition, female friendship, self-care, 
They're mothers and sticking to one's practice. They are charming and humble. Richie is funny. But at no point do any of them say the words, I have lots and lots of money and staff. In context of a conversation about the challenges facing working mothers, the omission is frankly bizarre. It is a basic responsibility of the privileged to refrain from taking credit for our own good fortune. They might as well have been reading from Ivanka Trump's book proposal. As with all the other panels, they do not take questions. So not only did I want to talk about this problem of elitism and classism and the fact that modern day Western wellness is very much been co-opted by the rich for the rich. But I also wanted to talk about a very unfortunate pipeline and that is the pipeline between wellness spaces and right-wing radicalization and conspiracy theories. In 2011, Charlotte Wells and David Voas coined the term conspirituality for this newfound phenomenon. Now, I'm not gonna get too into this today because I honestly think that this deserves a whole video Video of its own. But the wellness industry's cruxes almost are questioning authority, distrust of institutions, and embracing alternative medicines. And there is actually a lot of overlap between the wellness space and the conspiracy theory space. And this would only be further escalated by the pandemic. And the people who would engage with wellness content on social media were beginning to be fed conspiracy theories via the algorithm. I'm talking about conspiracy theories about COVID, 5G, vaccines, and even going as far as QAnon. If you don't know what QAnon is, it's a conspiracy theory where they believe that the world is being ran by satanic pedophiles and that Donald Trump is going to take them all down. I read a video, I, I read a video, I read a book about it over the summer and it's crazy. And the very unfortunate fact about conspiracy theories is that if you believe one, you are far more likely to believe another and then another and then another and then another until you are completely isolated from the people around you. The only thing that you you are reading on that you are being fed online is about conspiracy theories. The only people that you're talking to is other people who also believe in conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories have the capability to destroy friendships, to completely destroy families. I have seen videos of people, young people who say that they don't even talk to their parents anymore because their parents have been completely sucked in by conspiracy theories. People who have struggled with mental illness are far more susceptible to believing in conspiracy theories. People who are already very mentally unwell have had had very public, complete mental breakdowns because of conspiracy theories. You know, this isn't something that should be taken lightly. I think when we think of conspiracy theories, we think of like YouTube videos about Chuck E. Cheese pizza, but this isn't a laughing matter. It isn't a joke. I think it should be taken extremely seriously. And I think that Honestly, social media companies need to get their shit together when it comes to what algorithms are feeding people. You know, to wrap this video up, I'm not trying to say that if you do Pilates, you're gonna end up believing in conspiracy theories, but rather I want to emphasize the importance of recognizing modern day diet culture in its newest and changing forms and the importance of recognizing modern day wellness for what it is, which is diet culture. And if we just set diet culture aside for a second, the inherent problems that come with the wellness industry trying to function within a late stage capitalist system. The problems with engaging with wellness when wellness has become a business model, which is now going to prioritize profits over people and that the wellness space can become very quickly intoxicated when people can become more susceptible to believing in conspiracy theories and falling down complete rabbit holes and isolating themselves from the people who love and care about them the most. But yes, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was really, really interesting to to make and of course let me know your thoughts in the comments you know me I'm always nosy I always want to read what you guys are thinking but yeah I'll see you guys soon for my next video bye